Born and raised in real estate. I only know how to do real estate. And actually, what I know is how to analyze anything. You know, how the market moving, what are the prices, who is buying, who is selling, what's the strategy around, how the city, how is the city growing, how are people's mm. habits changing. The the market is very small. So whatever business or idea you have needs to relate to something overseas. It, it needs to be expandable. We want to help our clients make more money, right? Make yeah. more revenue. So the way we do that is that, you know, on the one hand, we're, we're helping them make better decisions when it comes to pricing of data, monitoring what's happening in the market. That's fine. But then we help them on the other side. We look at where are, are changes happening for you guys to proactively uh, take advantage of. And that's the whole idea. You know, transparency, we hope, and I think it is already, you know, it sort of brings more opportunity. I love it. Welcome to another episode of Made in Cyprus, big entrepreneurial and business stories from a tiny island. And today with me, we have Pablo Luizo, founder of Asquire. Welcome. Martin. Hi. Hello. How are you doing? Good. Good. Suffering. My wife is torturing me, like always. So life Cla is good. Classic. That's why I'm not getting married, you know. But <laughs> she's still torturing me. And actually, I decided also to work together with her just to make the torture, you know, more consistent. No, no, no days off. No. Uh, well, me and me and Pablos, we've been uh, working together for uh, almost two years now. I think we we met each other at uh, actually Stylianos event in uh, at, at Reflect a couple right. of years ago. Right. Uh, and then since then, uh, lots of things happened. But um, well, obviously I know and you know me, but the 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 who's watching who's watching us uh, might not know you. So do you want to give us a little introduction about yourself and uh, yeah, what brought you here? Sure, sure. sure. So I'm um, obviously I'm Cypriot. Maybe not so obviously anymore. But anyway, so I'm, <laughs> the, uh, the size wouldn't say that you're Cypriot. Size, you're not, you're no, not the average yes. uh, uh, Cypriot height, let's say. Yes. yes. <laughs> so I'm uh, six foot six or one ninety seven, which is not very Cypriot uh, <laughs> of me. So yeah. So I'm uh, Cypriot, born and bred in Nicosia. Family comes from uh, Limassol, uh, actually not far from uh, here in the in the center. Limassol town or Limassol town. Uh, Yazoni. My father is uh, from Yazoni, and my mother is from Bolemidia. Perfect. Uh, I am the butter boy, though, uh, from uh, Nicosia. So I was born and bred there. Uh, the, I've always been in real estate. Uh, my father uh, was a, one of the first valuers and then agents. Uh, so I grew up uh, running around in uh, various valuations or construction sites where my dad was doing project management, uh, you know, learning or understand, trying to figure out what was going on. Uh, from that, I was uh, forced to, I would say, uh, to follow the the family business, which was to enter into real estate, um, so I went to the UK to study. And then, in 2004, when I finished, I ended up working in the UK uh, in the city of London, uh, doing valuations, and then I moved into financial modeling and those types of things. Um, and that's where things started getting interesting because from Romania, uh, from London, I moved to Bucharest in 2007, stayed there for two years. I uh, was doing agency and consulting during the you know, sort of the end of the book. Mm -hmm. um, uh, came back to Cyprus. Uh, my father and I quickly realized that we couldn't work uh, together. <laughs> um, yeah, and sort of, and that as it was at that point that uh, sort of, I left in uh, 2011 and started creating a series of, of businesses. So uh, to- Always real estate. Though, right? Always so real estate. From I, born and raised in real estate. Basically. Born and raised in real estate. I had, uh, I said about some, at some point, not from, from here on uh, Riga Ferreu, mm -hmm. I was Nicola Dranda about, I had a sandwich shop uh, called Refresh. So sandwiches, salads. How did smoothie. that happen? Hey, look, I, I, uh, at some point I needed to lose weight. <laughs> right, so there was a lot of shuvlagia going. Uh, so you said I'm only gonna eat stuff that I cook myself, and that's why you opened a sandwich shop. Correct. <laughs> Correct. So I, so I solved my problem that way. So we ran that for two and a half years until the bailing happened, and then everything uh, fell apart. But yeah, I mean, I only know how to do real estate. It, it actually, what I know is how to analyze anything. You know, how's the market moving? What are the prices? Who is buying? Who is selling? So I'm more into the the you know why are things are happening? Not the development. Not the development. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm not. You know, I, I don't develop real estate. I don't sell real estate. I'm not on the agency side of things. It's more, what's the strategy around? Um, you know, how the city, how is the city growing? Uh, how are prices moving? How are people's mm. habits changing? Mm. Uh, because demographics play a very significant role. You know, less kids, fewer bedrooms. Uh, you know, 
if there are, you know, husband and wife both work, so you don't need a separate kitchen anymore. It's open plan kitchen. Yeah. Uh, you know, more technology. Or COVID as well, with all of a sudden, we care so much about home offices where like three years ago, no one really Nobody cared. give, you know, give the uh, shit about, about yeah, yeah, now, yeah. now everyone wants, or home gyms as well. So the perspective of the home totally changed. And I was, I was speaking with someone in real estate in London and he said that like from three years, from three years ago to now it's completely different because mm -hmm. they used to have the, the finance bros, which were never home. So all they wanted, it was just a flat to come home. Yeah, beautiful flat, shore, parking, try to have the nice car and everything. But now every single one of them is kind of upgrading to a place that has some living facilities mm. like working facilities okay. gym and things like cool. this so even all of that is is kind of is kind of changing yeah yeah, yeah. it's uh look uh, the world is changing usually it you have breaks yeah. right so uh yes you have long term trends clearly yeah. you know things are moving in one direction but then you have breaks so in cyprus you had clearly the you know the accession into the eu in 2004 uh, then you had the property crash that started sort of, you know, US, UK, hit us around 2009, 2008, 2009. Sort of was that 2013, obviously. Uh, then we had uh, COVID. Uh, and now we have, of course, the, uh, the war in uh, Ukraine yeah. um, and everything that goes with it. So every time something breaks, um, you have these breaks, you have big jumps. Uh, you also have, uh, let's say, the impact is felt more in uh, small countries uh, like ours, mm. um, which is why we all need, let's say, the level of dynamism you need to have to operate in, in Cyprus, I think in many ways is a lot different than in uh, in a bigger country that has uh, more stability. Because the heats are felt more, that's what you're saying, yeah? Uh, yeah, I mean, you have, uh, I mean, usually the market is, uh, whatever sector you are in, the market is so small, regardless of what you're doing, that you you end up with one two companies dominating that sector, and everybody else is trying to sort of underneath gotcha. trying to 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 do. eat the, eat eat the breadcrumbs basically. Correct, correct. And then something happens, and you're out. So real estate is one of those one of those markets in Cyprus, isn't it? Like yeah. I, I mean, like uh, literally the first time I moved in Cyprus, I thought that either everyone was a lawyer or an accountant yeah. or a real estate developer. Obviously, tourism, uh, hospitality, leaving leaving the more obvious side of things, being a very beautiful holiday holiday destination and a great island. Yeah. Uh, why so many? We don't have anything else. I think is the very simple answer. You have seventeen percent of Cyprus's GDP. So Cyprus's GDP is around twenty six billion. Seventeen uh, percent is generated by by real estate. Wow! Wow! One of the highest percentages wow. uh, in a proportion. What do we sell, right? So, and I won't bore everybody with uh, with history, but effectively, people come to Cyprus not because it's a lovely place. That's you know, that's what we say, say to so people. I must be the only one then. Probably. You must be the only one. <laughs> uh, actually, we're a bit in love, I think, as well. <laughs> but it's you know, people come to Cyprus uh, for taxes. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, if people come to Cyprus for taxes primarily, uh, then you need to encourage them to come by accommodating them somewhere and so on and so forth. So historically what uh, has happened, what is happening now is that we invite in one way or another foreigners to move to Cyprus. Uh, we built um, um, you know, apartments, mainly more recently more office space and so on and so forth uh, to accommodate them. So that becomes the main business. If you look at other businesses, you don't really have the critical mass to have a lot of companies that deal with it. So you know, we don't make anything. There is no manufacturing that takes place in Cyprus. A little bit of assembly here is there, but there is no manufacturing sector. Agriculture is also non-viable. Non basic, yeah. basic, whatever, right? So agriculture is off, manufacturing is off, high-tech, anything like that, not really. Education now is beginning to become a little bit with the number of universities we have around. So the main sectors that we have are sort of three. You have the services sector that are financial services associated mainly with overseas companies, right? So an overseas company that will have its bank account here and the lawyers and the accountants to take care of everything uh, for them. The real estate side, which is foreigners who come here, either British in their majority to retire mm -hmm. or other nationalities to invest, but basically to work for some of the companies that are here for tax reasons, and then tourism. 
So that's why real estate plays such a key role in the in the company. So in because, the there, economy. Because, because there is demand, basically. It's there is demand, and there is nobody, nothing else to to mm. deal with. That's why mm. you have also so many. Even even if you look at uh, you know advertising, marketing, whatever, the level of investment in real estate or the number of conferences that happen in, 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 regarding real estate compared to the rest of the conferences is a lot higher proportionally. And the reason that you don't have other sectors mm. uh, to really, it's not a bad thing. You have other, yeah. uh, you know, other countries have the same. Uh, it's just that that makes us more uh, susceptible to uh, peaks uh, and troughs, no. right? So you know, if you have, if you are over invested in on one thing, it, it also becomes more uh, volatile. You know, the interesting thing, one of the other things that shocked mm. me, because uh, I think everyone knows that like, I, I moved in, uh, in, in, in Cyprus and in Limassol about four years ago. It was going to be five in October. One of the things that uh, shocked me from the beginning is the big discrepancy between the level of bills and the, 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 the home availability there is in, in mm. Limassol, for example. So you have those crappy, shitty, dodgy, uh, tall buildings that you sneeze by passing by and the balcony will fall. Right by the seaside, and Limassol is full with that. I, I remember yeah. I was so shocked, so shocked to see such a big level of um, the grade. How can you call it? Basically, and yeah, then, yeah. and then, and then on the other side, on the completely far end of the spectrum, there are these mega luxurious, tall rise, multi million concierge, blah 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 blah. You you name it. Mm. Oh, how is it? How is it? I don't understand it. How is it possible that it goes from one side to yeah. the, to the other? Yeah. Uh, I, okay. The, the, I get that. I think there are three. We'll, let's break the problem into three parts. Mm. Or the uh, so. How has Cyprus? What is the composition of uh, Cypriot population? The population of Cyprus. So we are nine hundred thousand people, permanent population mm. on the free side. Where around 25%, 22, 23% are foreigners, right? non Greek Cypriot. As you can see, Pavlos knows his data. <laughs> <laughs> data machine. <laughs> so you have, yeah. So you have about 200,000 plus uh, foreigners who uh, call Cyprus permanently their home. This is as at 2021, uh, 2021. Last year, 2022, we had about 40,000 uh, individuals. 40,000 people moved to Cyprus. These are the people dislocated from the from the conflict. It's uh, 14,000 14, Ukrainians, so yes, from the conflict, but then, which wow. we count, then there are those that we don't count. We, I mean, the official statistics, yeah. which are Russians, Belarusians, and then you also have Lebanese, yeah. uh, because of the, situ- of the economic and political yeah. situation in Lebanon, and Israelis, more recently. Yeah. Now, those, we do- I say we don't count, or we count them a bit jokingly, because... The census happened in 2021, and the war started 2022. COVID stopped. So, so in 2022, we had another 40. So yeah. wow. uh, this influx in, in people uh, is co- has caused a lot of the what we na- are now experiencing with the very high rents, the, especially in Amazon and so on and so forth. And so forth. But if we go back to the history of the island. Until 1974, uh, the population of the island was fairly stable. I mean, okay, you had Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots. Uh, and this is before the conflict. This yeah. is before the mm-hmm. conflict, right? Uh, which started in 1963. Anyway, 1963 to 74, we had our internal uh, strife, internal, uh, effectively, civil war. And then in 74, you had the invasion. When the invasion happened, you had uh, 200,000 refugees that uh, in an island of what was then 600,000 people. So one third of the population lost their homes, and moved to the south. So at that point in time, from 74 to 76, these refugees lived in tents. And in 76, the government decided that, or realized, let's say, that, look, we're not going to go back anytime soon, so we need to build refugee housing. So during the late 70s and early 1980s, you had a lot of these refugees housing that you see uh, going up. So that's the first type of show the construction uh, that you see around. So fast houses, cheap. Fast houses, cheap. Now. Yeah. It's like get them, get them, out, of, get them out of the tents. Get them out of the tents. That, that, was, the, that was the request. Wow. The second thing that happened in, in, in Limassol in particular, and we have the, the falling uh, uh, verandas, uh, balconies, is that at the same time when our economy started booming, this was 1983, uh, they started 
expanding Limassol port. Yeah. We made it bigger and deeper. Uh, they took the, the sand, right? Put it next to it. And of course, with every contractor around. Oh my God. Yes. But you know what? <laughs> I'm so glad mm. you 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 raised the sun because uh, Zen got uh, purchased a house a uh, few years ago and he my business partner and he basically did all the renovation and one of the first thing to do was the flooring so it was break the flooring yeah what do you find under you find sand yeah no? yes yeah. Sand. sand and uh, seashells and stuff and I Beautiful. was uh, he sent me a photo and I was like uh, how does this make any sense? so that they use it as insul insulator yeah you what? use it uh, th 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 no, it's even worse. What they use there, right? So what the, yeah, no, it, it gets worse. So better we can fake it, but worse is very easy to find. So basically when you are, uh, when you build a floor, when you build a cement floor, right? Yeah. Somebody needs to straighten that floor sort of, you know, very well. And then nowadays you put glue and you glue the tile on the floor and then you leave a little gap and you put the grout in between. Before, an easy way to build without sort of dealing with how straight the floor floor was, was you build the, the slab, right? You put the concrete. It has some irregularities. So what do you do? You put sand on top of it, right? And as you are pushing the tiles down, they will find their level. That was the idea. So it was a very uh, cheap and cheerful uh, way to build. The problem that was created in Lima Sol mm -hmm. in particular mm -hmm. was that they took the sand from the port and they mixed it with the to make uh, with the cement to make concrete. Fuck. But where do you put the concrete? With the steel that you make the beams and the columns. Jesus Christ. Right? So you have uh, cement, fine. Uh, then you have okay, pebbles and stuff like that, okay. But then you have sand that came from the sea. And you put all those three together with water around uh, the steel. So, of course, you have uh, corrosion of the steel yeah. and everything falls apart. That, and, and so, the weakest point in the building is the balcony because it's hanging out. Just, just one beam, basically. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and like, let's not forget that uh, Cyprus is a quite active seismic area as well. Yeah, of course. You, we have a few earthquakes here and there, maintenance, and this sort of leads us to the next thing. So, you have sort of a lot of construction took place shoddily it had to happen had to happen uh, you know lots of late 70s early 80s yeah. then you had a second boom uh, which was uh, into the, in the big jump in in uh, the number of uh, residential properties that we have on the island happened between 2004 and 2008 uh, 70% increase in the number of properties on the island 70 70 from in, when in 4 years wow. 2004 until 2008 and the reason was that we were building apartments uh, for the British to buy to for right. So that was the second. Again, quickly put them up. Who cares about quality and whatever? That that that's why you see these, uh, you know. So there's uh, been these waves, basically. You have this wave, and this is just another wave right now, right? Mm. So we had the first. Which is the wave of the rich people. Yeah? The wave of the rich people. Mm. This is the wave of the rich people, where effectively what you have done is suddenly, uh, let's say, land that was. Okay, prime land in many cases, you know, good location, whatever. The government came and uh, came and gave very high uh, building density. Um, that's why you end up with high rises. You combine that with the tax uh, benefit on the one side that we have now and before the naturalization program with the passport. Boom, and you get boom, Limassol. You get Limassol. So suddenly Basically. you have, you know, somebody's home, uh, you know, single story home or two story home that's uh, been sitting there for forty years. Next to it, you had you have the building that was built in 1985, whatever, with the balconies falling off. And next to that, you have the no. uh, the high rise that uh, has sold for I don't know no, 12, 14. You have, uh, you have uh, the Papu and the Yaya, uh, the refugee seekers, and uh, the Russian billionaire. Correct. Basically, all exactly side to side, shoulder to shoulder. You it's see? fascinating. No discrimination in Cyprus. We are all together. <laughs> doesn't doesn't matter. <laughs> we'll get your money, whatever you whatever exactly. you're coming for. Exactly. So so really interesting. Two things. 
what can we do with these disgusting buildings if yeah. if you can do anything? Yeah. Because I know that, for example, I I come from Italy, right? So we also have our disgusting buildings, especially if you go in south, um, if you go into the uh, outskirts of the big metropolis, like anywhere, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but in this in in a town like Limassol, which is I think the economical center of 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 uh, the economical capital of of Cyprus, mm-hmm. if, if you like, you will expect to have to, to be some regulations on the internal and the external maintenance as well, which is actually really really hard to implement mm-hmm. because if you if you if you and i know because i'm looking to 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 get a property for a long long time i haven't figured out anything anything uh, decent um there is no law that says that you have to maintain take care internally no, 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 there is a law. no one no one enforces it nobody no. no so it's a because 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 even those those shitty flats <coughs> from the 70s yeah. if they were maintained from the 70s they wouldn't be, be fine yes 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 but everything begins with in Cyprus the the main problem if somebody were to call what is the main problem of Cyprus is we have laws but we do not enforce them we do not enforce laws so uh, this is the first thing and the second is that everything is done on incentives rather than disincentives mm-hmm. so there is a lot of carrot but there is limited stick interesting let me give two three examples for example you drive around here in the center of Limassol or Nicosia, Larnaga, whatever, and you find a lot of empty plots of land where people park their car. Correct. Right? And next to it is the Russian billionaire or millionaire, blah, blah, blah. You're like, okay, what is happening here? The answer is property taxes are very, very low. So people do not have an incentive or rather a disincentive to develop their land. Yeah. That is the start of the problem. There isn't enough supply. Right, so what you end up doing is that you have, uh, you know, empty plots of land in the city center. Uh, younger people are being pushed further pushed out. out. They have to drive in. They park in the empty plots of land that they find. Traffic, fine. traffic mm-hmm. problems, whatever. So these incentives are 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 not there. An enforcement of the law is not there. The second thing that you have is that you have fragmentation of ownership. You have that in other countries. So, mm. uh, but it's very irregular. Let's say where. You know, 64 percent of people in Cyprus live in apartments. So two thirds live in apartments. But these apartment buildings, where a small apartment building is around ten units, it means that you need these ten people to reach a decision. Yeah. For something, right? To maintain right. the building, to do whatever. That's your second problem that you have. There's no decision-making framework around. Maybe nine people will say yes, and one people will say no. When you're stuck, no, that's it. When you're stuck. No. Uh, this is your second problem, and and the third problem that uh, that you have is, you know, I think increasingly we sort of the the sense of community has been lost. Um, okay, that's a bigger issue, but you know this thing again of, because of these waves probably. Right? The way that so you that have, fragmented the the population even uh, further, the communities even correct. further. A lot of people have sold their parents or grandparents' houses or land uh, and built the newer b- properties further out. No. Uh, you don't really have I mean a, a lot of people do not have a relationship with their neighbors anymore. It's their neighbors just by name. I think it's a combination of that. But the main thing is the is the lack of being able to implement uh the law. You, you, there's no implementation of the yeah, law. policing. Yeah. But but not 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 all is uh, gray because uh, there are lots of people that are in this podcast like yourself as well that that is trying to change things right so sure. tell me about tell me about Asquire tell me why you started Asquire and sure. what is it sure sure so um, you know our our journey is a very startupy way of talking but you know we uh, came with an understanding so I spent the last ten years 2011 uh, onwards. Managing distressed real estate, uh, mainly for banks, private equity funds, advising them, both here in Cyprus, but also Greece, the Romania. Bad guys. Where the bad guys. <laughs> um, I, I would say I, I was the, you know, the uh, you know, prime uh, bad guy for, for many people. Uh, now, through that experience, what, what we saw was, A, I would say something very wrong, but you sort of realized why a lot of people went bust, no. right? Because it, you know, their businesses, had no chance of surviving on a good day. And they were over-levered because they owned a lot of real estate. So they were, you know, so, you know, you have very small business doing nothing with a lot of land, uh, owing millions. All be good. Uh, and everything would be fine, not because the banks saw that their repayment somehow was going to come from the land, which made no sense, rather than the business. So let's say it was a recipe, 
uh, set for disaster. But anyway, that's irrelevant. So what we realized at the time was that from managing all of these things, which meant uh, you know, valuing them, uh, preparing them for sale, insuring them, and so on and so forth, was that each one of these functions had overlaps. So you needed to know what the property is, where it is, size, square meters, uh, quality of construction, and so on and so forth. And we realized that in order to automate a lot of this decision making, which you know, is also unleashing the digital side, so being able to buy insurance online, see where actual properties are being sold, uh, create leads, and so on and so forth, you need to digitalize the real estate, which would then lead to automation. So what we did there was uh, we we saw this in 2020, uh, a couple of years ago, that uh, the uh, the European Union. Uh, has two uh, directives, what is called the Open Data Directive yep. that forces governments to open their databases, and then there is the Inspire Directive that standardizes how land registry data is released across yep. the EU. So we can say, okay, what do we need? Let's collect all the information that the state has, uh, and we will create the profile of all the buildings in all of the country. By the way, buildings, I mean, end land, so yep. every single asset. And you start from earthquakes, soil quality, flood risk, and so on and so forth. So the data was available. The data was available sitting in a government database, in multiple government databases, which the Cypriot government, much like the Greek government, Romanian, um, Swedish, whatever, are forced to open to the public no. uh, as part of this open data directive. Yeah, and but not many people were utilizing it. Uh, actually, not many people even now do. Mm. Uh, and I think it's a case of, uh, let's say uh, open data is not necessarily, it's, it's a, like a new thing. It's a new thing. There is this distrust about uh, what, what type of the quality of the data that is there and so on and so forth. But it's it's a case of, yeah, not, not many people utilize it, not yeah. people know that it's there. And also it's a case of what do you do with it? I, I think a lot of people in the, that work in startups uh, sorry, in general, they try to be, they are perfectionists about something or they, they come they approach a problem in a very narrow manner. Yeah, they take a niche approach. They take a niche approach. Our logic, which we'll see uh, whether it will be right or wrong, we can say, look, uh, we want to help everyone. So when it comes to real estate, you don't need to have 100% um, details of what is there because most people can get can get by with making a decision if they have 85, 90, 95% of the picture. And some it, some objectivity to the conversation, some correct, level. Correct. And from that point on, you're going to go there probably because it's a, real estate tends to be a big investment. Uh, you know, you're going to bring an engineer, you're going to bring an architect, you're going to bring a you know, specialist that will advise you on the specific asset. So you need a, a way to automate, as I said, the decision making. So we came in and said, okay, what we're going to do, we're going to be a funnel. We're going to collect all this data coming in. Great. We're going to merge them together as layers. Right? Like a like a burger. Uh, <laughs> it's so it's dinner time almost. Dinner time, I am. <laughs> so you end up with, uh, with with having all the information for all the properties across the island. Centralized in one place. Centralized in one place. And then you kind of say, okay, what do you want to do with it? So yeah. we kind of said, we sort of split our problem or <clears throat> our value uh, proposition to three parts. Number one, we call it real estate dynamics. So we map, we get transaction data from the land registry, all transactions that are completed every month. We get them, we clean them that these are apartments, these are houses, shops, and so on and so forth, and we map them individually. The second thing that we do is that every night we build a crawler that goes on the websites of all the banks, the funds, uh, all the properties in the foreclosure process, and we're also connected with the two main aggregators. Yeah. So 22,000 properties, we update them daily. Right. So we're able to map transactions on the one side, everything that's sold on the island from 1st of January 16. So it's about 145,000 properties individually mapped, and then 22,000 asking prices. So we're able to measure how long something has been on the market. Right. So this is sort of the first proposition. That's available to uh, developers, uh, are one of our clients, agents uh, to, to help their own clients who are looking to invest. We also have some who are individual investors who are you know, sort of buying and selling real estate. The second is environmental data. So again, Floods, uh, earthquakes, wildfire, but also data that is to ESG, demographics, and so on and so forth. 
So that data is to be made available to insurance companies, yep. uh, but also increasingly on the whole reporting that revolves around DSG for companies to automate their assessments and so on and so forth. The last thing, which is what we are building right now, which I, I find, or actually our clients find the, the coolest, is you know, sort of, you know, real estate is uh, you know, immobile, uh, immobile, uh, but actually when the change happens, right, when you have a change in real estate, is when the opportunity arises. So the moment somebody starts construction, it means that at that point in time, they, they the new, uh, you know, the developer, let's say, or whoever, is open to hearing from someone who is selling concrete, selling uh, the iron, selling windows, blah, 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 whatever, photovoltaic panels, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, or lifts. Uh, windows, lifts, whatever. Yeah. So what we do is that we map every month where there is new construction activity, where somebody breaks ground. That's the one. We also map every month uh, all the big projects that are, they get uh, permission from the Department of Environment, mm. hotels, uh, big offices, and so on and so forth. Um, and we uh, sell that data to our clients who are, have nothing to do with real estate in terms of transaction activity per se. Yeah. Uh, but they, they use that as a lead generator. Perfect. So you realize that a lot of the processes could be standardized, digitalized, which they mm -hmm. weren't. You realize that a lot of the data and information uh, that you needed to make this digitalization, let's say this digital footprint of the real estate uh, ecosystem in Cyprus was available. You collected it all into, into, one, into one place and made it available to everyone, basically, yeah? Correct, correct. So actually, if somebody goes on our website, on the AskWire website, uh, they can access all the, of the base information, the government information for free. And then from then from then on, uh, we everything else is on a subscription subscription basis. So, you know, as we said, developers, investors, whatever can look at transactions and asking Insurances prices and etc. Exactly, exactly. And our, our plan is uh, it's quite simple. We finished Cyprus. Um, we started monetizing the data as a service, so selling data in uh, September 2022. Uh, since April, we are uh, adding subscribers. Um, on the software as a service, yep. so the online uh, platform. Uh, and now we are getting close, uh, well, getting close. It's uh, July uh, 23. We're, hope, uh, we're finishing off uh, Greece. Nice. So uh, that's your expansion. Yeah? That's our expansion. So Greece is next. Uh, and then from that, uh, depending on how we go, hopefully in September, we're going to start working in uh, uh, Romania. Yeah. Um, and then we see. So, you know, our plan is, our plan, our, you know, what I'd like to see is to have all of the Balkans. Uh, so your vision is, let's say, your vision is to digitalize the, the whole, whole Balkans. The whole Balkans. Yeah. Right. So I want to do the Balkans because, uh, so I want to do the Balkans. The Balkans are, uh, I find them fascinating. I work in a number of countries, but I find them fascinating because they are leaping ahead. Right, so you have uh, you know one the, the fastest internet in Europe is in Romania, uh, or you know what's happening in Greece now with all the investments uh, going in. So you know we're going from uh, interesting. I didn't know. You know it, 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 it's amazing. The uh, in Western Europe, yes, you have when we say Western, let's say France, uh, the Netherlands, the usual uh, suspects, the usual suspects, whatever. Yes, there is more money, and yes, you have the headquarters of the big companies, whatever. But what you have is you have evolution, right? Things are moving from one to the next. So, you know, you're step seven, you go to step eight. You go to step eight, you go to step nine. And, and the reason you move into in steps is that you have inertia. So I already have something that works very well. So the next step is a progress on what I have that works very well. So there is momentum, basically. Yeah, correct. But when you go to less developed countries, Albania would be great, Montenegro, uh, Romania, outside Bucharest, would you consider Cyprus in that same group? Um, yeah, no. Cyprus, I would put in the more western side. And especially why they have no infrastructure. Right? So these countries, there are certain places, they have no infrastructure. So you have houses in Romania, in Transylvania, whatever, that do not have electricity. Right? But let's say you, let's say you, have, you are a house in Romania with no electricity. When you have electricity, when they come and put you electricity, they will put you at the top of the range electricity with probably photovoltaic panels Since they're and all the, rest. the cables. They will put mega fast uh, Wi Fi as well. So uh, that, those are the leaps. Those are the leaps. So yeah, yeah. They, these countries go it's from. Incremental upgrades. Right. 
Never right? So everybody else is moving seven, eight, eight, nine, whatever. These guys are going straight to number 15. Yeah. Right? You don't have a, this inertia pulling you back. This is why I find you know, the Balkans fascinating. So Western companies, again, Scandinavians and uh, the Western Europeans, don't want to go into the Balkans. It's a total mess. You need to talk to people, figure out the data. The countries are small. They don't make financial sense. Romania has 20 million people. Yeah. Bulgaria is six. Greece is 10. We are one. So it doesn't make sense. So our idea is you map all of the Balkans that are also messy, right? Messy in terms of geography, messy in terms of uh, systems, processes, but also messy in terms of earthquake zones and so on and so forth. There are countries in a change of flux. You know, things are changing a lot. And as we said before, where there is change, there is opportunity. So yeah. our, 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 this is our plan. Map the whole of the Balkans, which is around 80 million people. Uh, and then, uh, you know, make that available progressively to, to whomever you are. You are, uh, you know, the, one of our clients, the Finnish company, uh, Kone, who sells elevators. Okay. Yeah. Lead generation for them to put elevators. Uh, we talked to uh, food re- uh, retailers about how is uh, is this, our cities growing, right? So in Limassol, we have, uh, you know, Western Limassol is the one growing, Zagaki, Kolossi area, great. But what are people building? Are they building houses or are they building apartments? What type of apartments are they building? One bedroom, two bedroom, or three bedroom? Because that changes the number of clients that you're going to have. Uh, you know, should I, so if I am a fiber optic company and I'm going to roll out, I don't know, 30 kilometers of fiber yeah. in the next year, where, where should I dig to put it? So all of these uh, you know, questions is what we're trying to hear our clients uh, answer. So anyone can understand real estate. Because the, 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 when we were working together and we were developing the brand strategy and the brand, I remember that uh, then we, we landed on, the, on that concept, right? right? So we make it available, we make it open, so finally someone understands real estate. Because right. currently in Cyprus, you say one thing, I say one thing, the other person says one thing. I remember when we started working together, one of the, one of the key elements was of how it would be awesome to objectify rationalize Correct. decision making and and processing into real estate because interesting enough even if as you said before 70% of of the wealth of cyprus comes comes from the from the real estate no. 17 yeah, yeah sorry yeah. sorry uh, uh, and um <coughs> it's not digitalized at all no no it's not and and and, and this is where uh, when i came back to cyprus in 2009 the we did not have, uh, it's when the market sort of started, not sort of, but started, started turning down. Yeah. And there were a lot of discussions, you know, is the market going down? No, it's not. Why? No. Is the bubble? Is it's a bubble? Was it? And, uh, you know, at that point in time, we started, uh, I joined the uh, RICS, the Royal Institute of Charter Surveyors, the local association, and we brought the University of Reading uh, UK, uh, UK to Cyprus, and we built the first property price index mm. for uh, apartments. And this was 2009. 2009. Q4 no. 2009 was the first one. And the reason uh, we did that uh, was that we wanted to give a, uh, let's say, an independent view of what was happening on the market in a manner that was easily accessible to any, everyone. Brilliant. Th- that was the plan. Now, in you know, 10 years later, we go a step further. We can say for each and every property that is being sold and for each and every property that's on the market, this is the price that has transacted or is being asked, and these are the characteristics that go with it. Now, many people, uh, you know, let's say ex-colleagues of mine in the real estate sector, other values or agents, would turn around and say, you are giving people or the, the public too much information, right? You are confusing them. You are killing our jobs and so on and so forth. I don't, I don't believe that. You know, you know, you give people if you make things transparent. First of all, you help people transact more easily with more confidence and so on and so forth. And you, as a professional, actually stop saying "I think," and you you go into uh, substantiating your view using actual numbers. I think this is what we're trying. You uh, build to trust. Do. You need to build trust. You need to build trust. And the trust needs to go beyond, uh, you know, we uh, broke bread together and we had a couple of beers and uh, that type of thing, or you're my lawyer, you're a brand and whatever. If I can show you why this is a good investment or a bad investment, 
why you know this area has a problem with I don't know soil subsidence. Let's say with the risks. <clears throat> what if I can help you? And this is where the lead generation comes into play. We want to help our clients make more money, right? Make yeah. more revenue. So the way we do that is that you know on the one hand. We're, we're helping them make better decisions when it comes to pricing of data, monitoring what's happening in the market. That's fine. But then we help them on the other side with, okay, where are, are changes happening for you guys to proactively uh, take advantage of? And that's the whole idea. You know, transparency, we hope, and I think it is already, you know, it sort of brings more opportunity I love it. Uh, for development. I love it. And, and, I, and I think as we were discussing before, uh, real estate is somewhat being a controversial market with these waves happening and something had to happen, something didn't not have to happen, like the passport and this luxury build and everything. And, and the idea of someone in Cyprus democratizing the real estate conversation, making it available for people, but also... Um, yeah, removing subjectivity and 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 I like how you you position yourself as a service business, helping other business succeed instead of competing with them. You're mm -hmm. helping them succeed by yourself. So in in a way, you succeed if they succeed, Correct. right? So being the traditional B two B offerings. But but why did Pablo Luizo, uh, you know, go away from traditional real estate and value and went into something uncharted? Because this is startup life, isn't it? Like yeah. uh, you live with uh, the spice under your seat in a way, isn't? It. Yes. Who who made you do that after you were born and raised in real estate? You probably didn't have to, right? Uh, no, I didn't have to. I mean, I'm an only uh, only child, so I didn't even have to compete with anybody else uh, <laughs> in the family. Uh, in the family, uh, the business was there. You know, uh, my father. Uh, you know, at uh, you know the heyday in 2008, we had 83 staff, six offices in Cyprus, wow. office in Romania, office in Moscow, whatever. So you know, the business was fine. I, I think the uh, it was. Let's say when he and I had a heart-to-heart -heart, uh, discussion, was that he came and said, "Look, we have a business that does valuation, agency, and project management. Okay, uh, you know, at some point, uh, this business will be yours. But uh, this was the, this is the part of many Cypriot parents. You cannot change anything, <laughs> right? Uh, you see that a lot of Cypriot parents do that with their kids when they give them real estate. Like, I love that." that uh, Funny that you said that because that, that gives me a deeper granularity and understanding how sometimes I'm engaged with the new owners of the business, which are the kids taking over, but that ultimately the father or the, the, the former owner is still there in the decisional process. So nothing changes. Nothing changes. And it's, and it's a case of you, have a, you end up with a golden cage, right? So the question here is, as you were growing up, did you ever think, were you able to think, even, that you could do something different than the family business? This is the first question. Fascinating. Uh, second, you, you, you went into the family business. Are you good enough to do the job and are you good enough to be the person running the business? Right. It has nothing to do with, with that. And then third is, do you have the ability to change the business the way or run the business the way you want? For me, the moment I realized that you couldn't. I couldn't change or, you know, let's say I would end up in a situation, by the way, you have a lot of people in the same situation, hoping that their parents, that they, my father would die for me to take over the business at that point in time, and then when it changes. Being free to do. Like, can you imagine, like I'm sitting around, we're having dinner at the family dinner, and I say, okay, I hope you die because... Then TikTok, we can let's do, see. Yes, because I want to change this and do the different marketing. And do, no, it, it doesn't work. So I'm like, look, I'm, I'm ecstatic. You keep your business, run it, go crazy. We're all friends, and I will leave. So I actually took uh, the chair that I had, the house chair, uh, got a, bought a laptop on sales, and I bought a printer. That was my major investment. And uh, yeah, we got going with that. Pablo Luizzo Enterprises. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it was called the Leaf Research, right? <laughs> Leaf, because there's a, it's a poem. So, but at that point, you didn't really know what to do. No, I had no idea. Like 2011, it was uh, 1st October 2011. Um, uh, you know, day one was set up my email where I was trying to figure out how to set up Gmail so that it didn't look at, at gmail.com. Uh, I had to print business cards. Uh, you know, how do you make a logo? I took a photo from somewhere. I put it together. You know, that, that, you know, that was day one. Hey, on day two, what do you do? You have nothing to do. So I did. Uh, you know, there is a very, there's a very interesting book called Influence by mm -hmm. Caldini. Yeah, I think most people, have, a lot of people have read. 
uh, and he says, ask for help. So I took my phone and I started with, hey, Andreas, like everyone, and I started calling people. You know, hello, how are you? I need help. I started this business. How, you know, can you help me? Can you help me? Can you help me? And very soon, when you when you put yourself out there, uh, people people help, right? Not everyone, of course, right? But uh, I've never had an issue of asking uh, for help or saying I don't know. Yeah, right. So that's that's sort of how we got going, and then we got lucky. Frankly, we got lucky because uh, we started at the time collecting and mapping real estate data. This is back 2011, right? So this is 12, 13 years ago now. Uh, and then PIMCO came to the island in 2012 uh, to do the stress test on the Cypriot banking system. And we got a random email out of nowhere uh, saying, you know, you are invited to pitch to work for PIMCO. These, you know, huge consultants that flew in from LA to advise, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, long story short, we, had, we were the only ones on the island who had clean data on transactions Fantastic. and prices with her. And this is 2011? That's, that's quite 2011. early for secret standards data-wise, huh? Yeah, yeah, no, we were the first. Nobody even had thought about taking data, mapping, cleaning, whatever, because we were still in the idea of my opinion counts. Yeah. Right? So what we did on the back of that was we ended up being the advisors of PIMCO uh, on set, you know, limited input, but yeah. we advised on that. Then BlackRock came to the island to do stresses on the Greek banks on the island, so we ended up advising them. Then we worked with Ernst Young on the recapitalization of the co-ops. Amazing. So, you know, big projects, whether we're talking about two persons sitting in, uh, in, in the kitchen, right? I mean, that, that, was, that was what we were doing. But what I love about this is that, that um, <laughs> uh, you were ballsy. Going out of the the family family business at home, especially in a, in a in a situation where not many others in Cyprus, I think, will have will have taken that that route. And I loved how you uh, just sat down and you started asking and talk, and talking with people. And 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 the, I think the lesson in there uh, from here is that like if you if you want it and if you go for it, things will will come. And you said that you got lucky, but maybe maybe you deserve it because you did something. Right, so you were you were there, you were visualizing, you were going for it, and I think if if you don't even try, things will do not will not happen. I mean, what's the, if you don't do it, you know it's not going to happen. Yeah. Right. So if you try, it's the only chance you have for it to happen. Right. right? Okay. So you know, my approach was always, uh, and this is what we were told also because you know after that we ended up working in Greece for some of the banks. But anyway, but there are two schools of thought. There was the uh, tra more traditional, I would call it the banking approach of ask for permission. So before we made a decision, we needed to ha ask the boss, ask the head of legal, ask this person, the other, get everything signed Respect up. Respect the hierarchy. Correct. And then there was the American approach, uh, which was my, my, sort of my last job uh, mm -hmm. where I was head of real estate at Should Gordia. first ask question later. Yeah, it was ask for forgiveness, right? So, you know, yeah. And I must say that the second is uh, I feel more comfortable. Let's say. Yeah, it's so. probably that's why we connected as well, isn't it? Like at the at, at the beginning, and I, the, I love that. So, what would you what would you say were your lessons by being an entrepreneur and a startup founder in in Cyprus specifically? Because you were born and raised here, so you you did not well you traveled obviously, so you yeah. know you know how things work uh, externally. What did you learn by being a startupper in Cyprus? I'll say what I learned, and then we can talk about the you know the pros and cons of doing that inside. Yeah. First of all, the the market is very small, right? So whatever business or idea you have needs to relate to something overseas. It, it needs to be expandable, right? Yeah. Because it's a great place as a sandbox. So to start to learn to do whatever to be based here. So Cyprus is an MVP basically, isn't correct. it? Correct, like, correct, and MVP. actually it's a great MVP because it. It's one million people, uh, so it's you know it, it's a good network. Everyone uh, knows everyone. Everyone so. knows everyone. Legal, legal system is pretty straightforward. Legal accounting, yeah. no. everything is fine. So you know, great place to start a business, test it, whatever. But you need to to start with the idea that sort of, sort of knowing that you need to be scaling yeah. outside if the country. If you want to be successful and make money, you need to, to leave the island. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. And then would you say that Greece is the natural? Expansion. I think this is the natural expansion for Cypriots because of the language and Cultural. the connection. From a business decision, even though now we have expanded to Greece, I think it was a mistake. 
because Greece is also a small market. It's 10 million people, right? And you have a lot of Greek entrepreneurs who are sort of trying to do the same uh, thing. So I think this is the so same. The chances that your competition will be bigger are much higher. You no, know, the market isn't big enough. No. But the competition, but there is, there is also competition. There's also competition, yeah. right? So yeah, yeah, instead of, I'm moving from the one million to go to 10. Yeah. And there's probably going to be a lot of competition. No. Okay. I could go to the UK. Depending on how business it is, I can go to Germany. I can go to mm. Romania, which is twenty million people. I can go to Turkey, maybe. I can go to you know, you can go maybe a lot of Israeli companies that are based here. They target directly the US because there is a natural link. So I think yes, naturally, a lot of Cypriots will go to Greece. I think it's a mistake. Yeah, uh, to, to sort of go there. So sort of pull back. Step one, I think what I, what I learned was set up in Cyprus, scale out of the country very quickly. This is step one. I think the second is that the local people here or the people who are locally here, they have knowledge that you, you could rely on, bounce ideas around, whatever, but the market isn't deep enough, let's say, in terms of knowledge and experiences. We haven't had, yes, we have some of the companies in the you know FX and the trading and so on and so forth that are you know, big, obviously, from a technology point of view, but in terms of other companies on there and that have scaled, you know, you have big exits and so on and so forth, there are only a handful, not even a handful, maybe even, you know, a couple. So there's a lack of experience, let's say, on there in terms of what you want to do. So you need to talk to some people locally, yes, but also get a lot of knowledge from overseas. I think the third is that there are a lot of, um, and I think this is important because a lot of people will take advantage, they will try to take advantage of you. Come and say, I will help you raise money and I will charge you 7% interest. Or I will connect you with this guy, but I want a fee. Everybody wants a fee. Right? I think this is the same. Um, so lesson number one is scale out of the country quickly. Lesson number two is learn from the locals or of the talent that is locally, but be aware that there is not lack of depth so you need to speak to overseas. I think the third thing, and that doesn't necessarily relate to Cyprus, but is especially when it comes to technology and startups, people are very open to speaking with you, sharing knowledge and whatever. So uh, similarly to what I had done in 2011, again in 2020 when we started, you know, random uh, LinkedIn messages, hey, how are you doing? Build the network. Yeah. Build the network, whatever, but not for business development, more, you know, I'm doing this, I just started, never done this before, do you have 10 minutes to chat? Yeah. The number of people that replied back uh, and I'm talking about 70-80%. Yes, of course, when do you have time? Amazing. And this is how actually we got our first investor. Amazing. Um, you know, random email on LinkedIn. Uh, so a message on LinkedIn saying, you know, hi, I'm doing this. Uh, you know, do you have 10 minutes to have a chat? And the chat sort of rolls on to everything else. Amazing. Yeah. Right, so to, to land it down, do you have a joke for us? Uh, it can be a dad joke. Actually, dad jokes are the best. Dad jokes are the best. I don't know that's the best. I to think about that. A dad joke is uh, just a bad joke. Let's figure out a, a, a joke. I have no idea how to joke. You can Google it. I can Google. I, I actually tried to use chat uh, GPT to get jokes. I got like 15 before I walked in. I must say, you know. They were let's, all bad. Let's say humor and uh, chat GPT, they, yeah. they, haven't, uh, yeah. uh, they haven't reached uh, one another. I, 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 uh, I think you're, I'm going to pass on that one, and I promise I'll take two jokes the next time you bring me here. No, but we need one. Um, uh, We're gonna have to, uh, you're going to have to Google it or something. I have, to Google, I don't have yeah. phone. <laughs> right, so I'll get the phone. And I'll, get the, I'll get the phone and we'll Google it. Um, the other question that I want to ask you is, what would you like to ask another founder and entrepreneur like you in Cyprus? Because this show is all about big entrepreneurial journeys on a tiny island, right? So we will be talking with like people like you. What would you like to ask someone else like you? I think the... Something that troubles me, let's say, mm. is to what extent they feel that uh, by raising equity and getting investors coming in, it begins to cheapen uh, what they're doing. Yeah. Right? Because, uh, you know, yes, you are investors. Uh, obviously, they uh, they like you. They like the idea. But it's the money that they like. 
right? It's the tax breaks that they get coming in, yeah. uh, and it's the hope for return coming out. Yeah. At the same time, because you have them there, you begin to make decisions uh, differently. Uh, you have to, you spend a lot of time, uh, you know, reporting to them and doing whatever. So at some point, the uh, romance of uh, you know, I have my own company and I'm building it and I'm doing whatever uh, I want. Uh, in many ways, days out. So, so you're, you're feeling like uh, you're kind of like losing control slowly. Yeah, but you, you are losing. Uh, it's not about control of the company. Yeah. It's about watering down what you're trying to do. Yeah. So right. uh, if I didn't have 27% of the company, uh, of our company belongs to invest. Uh, we're now raising another round. So again, we will get that. So basically the question is until... What percentage is too much? Yeah. Uh, well, it's not always percent. The, the moment you even get one of them in, yeah, right. Your dream of I'm gonna uh, you know sort of map. I'm gonna digitalize all of the infrastructure, all of the properties in in the Balkans, and I'm gonna make that available to companies. And people are gonna go out and you know build their infrastructure on top of mine. And you know we're gonna go crazy. And that, that sort of was and is my vision. But at the same time, now it's more a case of okay, have these investors in. We're scaling very quickly because we're scaling so quickly, a lot faster than I would, I would if I was on my own, right? But so, but we are under pressure to scale very quickly. We're scaling very quickly, so we're burning through more money. Yeah. Because we're burning through money, we have to raise money. Uh, okay, so what do we do? Well, we need to finish something and we need to put it out there on the market uh, to sell to get subscribers. So you you end up. It's a spin, yeah. It's a spin. That makes sense. So I think that would be an interesting. That's a great. That's a great. That's a great question, and uh, not related to, to to this question necessarily. But who would you like uh, to see on this show? I'd like to see uh, Mariana Dimitriadis. I think would be a good addition. Perfect. Uh, I met Mariana. Her. We're coming for you, huh? <laughs> uh, Mariana is very cool. She's uh, she's Greek. Lives in uh, here in Limassol. Uh, is married to a Cypriot. Perfect. So very much a Limassolian, and she does a lot of uh, you know cool research on uh, cancer. No. Um, so I think she's an interesting person to talk about her journey, how she ended up with her company. We will, and how we will she's get growing. there. Like uh, it's it's crazy. I think people do not realize how tiny this place is because like uh, Cyprus, it's uh, and especially the free part is smaller than the region in Italy I grew up. Okay. By population, by size, by everything, uh, but there is a lot of entrepreneurs, founders, and doers like yourself doing some really, really cool stuff in here. And the reason why we wanted to start this show is to give these people a voice, mm -hmm. uh, promote them, uh, network, but also promote Cyprus the brand, right? So going sure. away from only being a touristic destination, only being uh, you know tax heaven and real estate playground and mm -hmm. all of that, going into a place where great minds, great people are doing great stuff, And and I like you said, perfect sandbox, perfect testing opportunity. Come here, make it happen because it's possible. Possible. I think the the big thing here, the, the big difference, and I'm comparing now Cyprus with Greece, right? Yeah. Is that I look at uh, the startup companies in Greece, and frankly, what we are seeing here on the island is much better. Yeah. Right. And I know that. I'm going to get slaughtered when I go to Greece in two days. But we cut this. We cut this. <laughs> but, and I think it's better because the, the fact that you are on a small island uh, means that you need to be very practical. Yeah. Right? You have a small market. Uh, the amounts that we are talking, you know, you need to go to market very quickly. The market is very small. So whatever you need, to, as we said, we need to scale very quickly. You need to be able bam, to bam, maneuver. Bam, 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 bam. Yeah. And like, so... Uh, And there is, and let's say the startup world, in a way, is uh, locally, is mainly immigrants, is the locals who are, I would say, natural entrepreneurs, right? And I say naturally because you have a lot of locals who have their own businesses on the side, they're doing stuff like that, they have a small shop, they have yeah. this and the other. You have a lot of foreigners that have come in, a lot of talent that has come in from Israel, from Russia, Belarus, uh, Scandinavia, Germany. Uh, the Middle East and so on and so forth, who all of these Italy. people, Italy, <laughs> who, who all of these people, what they have a, a common is that they are naturally adventure uh, seekers and risk so takers. Right? Yeah, so you I have, never thought it this way. You're absolutely you right. have, so you have all these people together. Why you go to another country, another um, capital city, 
you know, Bucharest, uh, Belgrade, whatever, you don't get this level of mix, this, let's say, you know, everybody trying to outdo one another and also all of the, so many risk takers in one go. A melting pot of risk takers. A melting pot it. of risk takers, right? So, uh, and, 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 and this risk taking one, you know, you can take risk, but also you need to be more practical uh, to get out of it. I mean, I the, it. yeah, so I think this is the, the advantage of the island. That, uh, I love and, it. I never, I never thought it that way, and I absolutely love it. Uh, Cyprus as a melting pot of risk taker, because you're absolutely right. Uh, since you change the country, you might as well take another risk and open something, do something, right? Okay. So since the mentality of changing, doing, and risking is already there, that's beautiful. Well, Pablo, thank you very much. I'm not gonna let you go without with a joke. We're gonna oh. take a little break. He's gonna brainstorm a joke, and he's gonna tell. He's gonna tell us the joke, because. Everyone has to tell us. Everyone has to. But uh, thank you for being with us. Thank you for spending time with us, for for sharing your story. And uh, go Team Cyprus. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Pleasure. Thank you. Right. You have a joke for us? Well, it's not necessarily funny, right? But So, joke goes like this. Uh, you know, there's... Uh, the estate agent sold me a two-story house. One story before I bought it, and one story after I bought it. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> and with this, see you next time. <laughs>